All right, I'll get started with just some intro on uh, the, the topic and a few other resources to be aware of, and then we'll turn it over to our speakers. Um, so thanks so much for coming to today's Bench to Market talk. The focus of today is going to be all about intellectual property, so talking about some basics of IP and then some strategy for academic entrepreneurs. Uh, our next talk in this series is going to be on January 18th, and this is going to be all about investment and dilution, business strategies for equity negotiation. And this is going to be from Dr. James Stubbs, who's given this talk a number of times in the past. Um, it should be a really good one. There are registration links available on our website. And um, as a heads up, this will be a hybrid event. So there will be an in-person option um, at the Citith Room 1128 on IVB on the Georgia Tech campus. Um, and there will also be a Zoom option as well on our website. So please uh, feel free to register for that one. And uh, Biolocity is currently accepting applications for funding. We've got one day left in our technology scout. So um, if, you, if you've got a technology that's looking for some seed funding, um, we encourage you to reach out. Even if uh, we can't fit you in in this funding cycle, we're always open to talk to um, academic entrepreneurs. It's never too early to reach out to our team throughout the year. Um, so we'd love to learn more about what you're working on. A new offering from Biolocity is the Lab to Launch Incubator Space. This is going to be shared lab space that we're opening in the first quarter of next year. I think we've just closed the first round of applications for space within this program, um, but we anticipate that there will be some future cycles in, in the years to come, so please keep in touch. Uh, if you've got questions about the Lab to Launch space, uh, please feel free to contact Harry Gerard. His info is at the, at the bottom of this page. Another resource available through Biolocity are what we call legal office hours. So this is with uh, Emory School of Law professor Nicole Morris. Um, if you've got questions about intellectual property, um, especially stemming from the conversation today, um, you can feel free to follow up with our panelists or sign up for legal office hours with, uh, with Professor Morris um, on our website. Biolocity is also part of the BARDA Drive Accelerator Network, and this allows us to expand our reach beyond just the Georgia Tech and Emory ecosystem. Uh, they publish a series of areas of interest for funding throughout the year, um, so you can check out their website or ours for a current list of funding opportunities for them. If you think you might have a technology that could be suitable for one of their opportunities, please feel free to reach out to us and we can connect you with the appropriate folks at BARDA. And to help facilitate that, BARDA is also launching an office hours um, program of their own. Currently, they're going to be holding these on the last Wednesday of each month from 3 to 5 p.m. Um, so please feel free to reach out to us and we can, we can help set you up with a meeting with them as well. Okay, so back to today's talk. I'm really um, excited for this topic. Intellectual property is something that's pretty near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm very excited to welcome our, our two speakers, uh, my former colleague and friend, Sarah Wilkening, who's a patent agent at Troutman Pepper, um, and her colleague and a partner at Troutman Pepper, Rusty Close, who's also a registered patent attorney. Um, they'll be giving a talk on IP basics and strategy. And then after their talk, we'll be joined by Mary Albertson, the director of GTRC's Office of Technology Licensing, and Laura Fritz, Emory's Chief IP Officer and Director of Patent License Strategy. So if you've got any questions about IP or specific institutional questions for any of our panelists, um, it should be a really great discussion at the end of this talk. And without further ado, I will stop sharing and turn it over to Sarah and Rusty. Thanks, John. Let's see. This is <laughs> Everyone can see the slides? Looks good. Oh, perfect. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining. Um, this is our, our second year doing this talk on patentability by our patent strategies and freedom to operate. And I think an overarching question that we really want to address is, is a patent right for you? And so this is why I brought my colleague, Rusty Close, to help me determine uh, whether patents are always necessary. And during this talk, I'll give a little uh, hypothetical invention that I have created um, to see. Literally dreamt up. Yeah, I literally, well, I was awake when I talked. Okay. But <laughs> yes, exactly. We'll kind of go through the process of if a patent is right for, for me. Um, but here's our typical disclaimer that um, this is our opinions, our personal opinions. This is not the opinion of Chaplin Pepper, Hamilton Sanders. Um, but we can kind of skip over this um, contract language. <laughs> so, what is IP but anyways? And I think if you're already joining this, this talk, you already have an idea of what it's about and who cares about it. Obviously you're here, so you care about it. Um, but if you are also trying to do a startup company, 
this could be helpful for trying to get funding so you can show um, potential investors that you have something that's worth protecting. It can also prevent competitors from stealing your ideas, similar to when you publish articles, you show that you created this technology first. Um, and in general, it can protect your investments and in research. And so we have um, Georgia Tech and Emory people here that are also gonna help discuss this too, about how you can protect your research through their offices. Um, so IP in general, I think everyone uh, that's probably joined this call maybe has a good idea of the basics, but just to give an overview, we'll focus most of our talk on patents, but to give a big picture of IP in general, uh, trade secrets, I think everyone has a really great example of being in Georgia, Coca-Cola is a great example of a trade secret, and the trade secret can last uh, forever as long as it remains a secret. Um, we also have copyrights. Um, we don't have a good example for that because it's just uh, original and creative expressions that are protected that are in some sort of tangible form. Um, and then finally, trademarks are more, I think of that as like a brand. Uh, you look at um, some sort of design or phrase and that kind of gives you an idea of the brand that's protecting it. So just do it and the swoosh are Nike. Um, but that's kind of about you know, what patents are, and here's just a, an example. <laughs> um, but I guess before we do, um, I want to mention that, uh, that all these IP can overlap all together. Um, I think a great example, and we may have given this last year too, but an example of a, a watch could cover all of these different areas of IP. So you have the how the watch actually functions, the gears behind it could be covered by some sort of patent. Um, you could have some branding on it. Maybe it's an Apple product and that could be a, a trademark. And then maybe the band is protected by, with some sort of uh, specific design on it that could be copyrighted. And then overall, it has some sort of um, trade secret in the design of how it's, how it's made or maybe some software that's on the watch could be um, some sort of trade secret. But um, Rusty, let's dig into what patents give me. So um, can you give me an overview of what patents are and kind of coming to you as an inventor? Yeah, I mean, usually when I get these questions, people come in and patents, they think are going to kind of be a magic bullet for them and their business. And, you know, so we, we want to start talking about what does a patent do, which is not always an intuitive question. And we'll get into that a little bit. But the idea is that it gives you the right to exclude others from making or using or selling or doing the thing that you have a patent for. And that's a key distinction there. It's a right to exclude others from doing that thing. It does not give you the right to do that thing. And we can get into that a little bit and why that's such a tricky distinction to make. But if you walk away from you know, any discussion about patents, I think the big takeaway should be it's not an affirmative right for myself. It's not giving me the right to do the thing I've invented or gotten a patent on. It is my right to exclude others from doing it. Thank you. Well, before we get into the nitty gritty of my invention, I do wanna kind of segue into inventorship and how this is important when we talk about the patents and what we can protect. Um, so an inventor is gonna be someone that conceives of the idea and it's, going to be uh, defined by when the con conception was complete or when it was reduced to practice. And we have some great examples to kind of point out to, to carve out what's the difference between when your conception is complete or when it's reduced to practice. So here's the first example. Um, say it's Rusty has an idea to put ink inside some sort of tube to use it in writing. And so he has come up with the idea and he wants to get it done. He wants to put it into um, practice essentially. So he actually, he's come up with this invention of this pen, right? He's conceived the idea. And let's, we're, we're suspending disbelief a little bit here, Thank thinking you. that a pen has not yet been invented, but it's a simple example that kind of helps us illustrate some of the concepts that we're talking about. So there are no pens. I have invented the first pen. That's right. That's right. But you actually come to me and you ask me to build it for me. For correct. You. Correct. You just give me instructions to put the ink inside the cylindrical tube. And now I have reduced Rusty's invention to practice. I've actually made it and now maybe written something down. So that is something that kind of shows that he's 
and inform me on how to do this. And now we've created the invention and reduced it to practice. You can also file a patent application to reduce something to practice. It does not have to be actually making a prototype. But I do want to carve out that me putting the pen together based on Rusty's information about the invention does not mean that I became the inventor. I just helped reduce it to practice. Now, if I put this ink inside the centrifugal tube and say the ink's kind of spilling out at the end, I'm gonna put a little ball at the end of it. I've created the ballpoint pen. I have improved on your invention and I maybe I'm an inventor. Yeah, maybe in that instance where we are now co-inventors on this idea that, you know, my, my grand invention of the pen itself. Yes. And then for researchers that are publishing their research, I do wanna carve out inventorship is not the same thing as co-authorship. And then there's a small distinction of ownership we'll dig into. But specifically, co-authors on your papers, I think I was a co-author on several papers in grad school just by doing the some of the imaging for the chemical structures. So that would not have made me an inventor. I did not come up with that chemical structure. But so there's just a, a distinction between co-authorship and co-inventorship. In, co and that's something that your tech transfer office will help you distinguish if you would want to dig into that further for, on a case-by-case -case basis. Just in general, you know, you may be a co-author and not an inventor if your contribution to the paper is, say, for example, you're the one who's explaining the background information. You're the, you're the one who is sort of really setting up the background, what people know at the time, and and where you are when the inventor actually got to the invention itself. So you've contributed to the paper. You're not necessarily a, a co-inventor of the invention. That's right. And then digging even deeper, ownership can be something that is set forth in some sort of employment contract. It might be something that you signed when you started working, an IP assignment. Um, so that's something that you might see when you work in the university, some things that are going to be dependent case by case on the university's IP policy is if they have some sort of carve out that anything that you create during your time using their resources is going to be owned by the employer. Um, there might be a specific carve out that if it's not within the scope of your employment that you might be the owner of that. Now you'll still be an inventor. I can still be an inventor, but you might have a duty to assign your rights to some sort of employer. So this kind of, this is an important one as well, because the default rule is that as the inventor, you are the owner, but we are generally subject to employment contracts, you know, things that we don't really think about in terms of, you know, having to do with our inventorship. And so, you know, there may be paperwork in place that changes what the default rule is. And usually that's the employment agreement. And like Sarah said, if it's something that you invent in the course of your employment, you have agreed in your employment agreement to assign that new invention to your employer. So the default is that you own it. The paperwork changes that default. That's right. So now we're digging into it, whether you need a patent. And so for those of you that were able to join us last year, I came to Rusty with my new invention of my pet displaying bag. Um, those of you that are uh, lucky enough to, or maybe unlucky to join us again, the second year in a row here, um, you'll discover that during a patentability assessment talking to Rusty, I looked at a couple of other factors of whether the patent was right for me. And we'll dig into this for my new invention, but what we discovered last year was there were some patents that currently existed that may have been problematic and maybe something I shouldn't invest my energy resources and time into. But this year, I promise I have a really great invention. So this year, I actually got this uh, spark of, of, of innovation, um, if you say, if you will. Um, in the middle of the night, I got a phone call from my mother-in-law um, at 3.15 on a Saturday morning and saw that she was calling, uh, maybe someone had died. I sprang up and answered it, only to listen for about 45 seconds to realize that she was probably cleaning. Uh, I think in her, in her before retirement days, she had really odd hours as a nurse and she just has trouble sleeping now. So I hung up 
and uh, wanted to text some rude message, but again, I just decided to come up with this invention instead. Instead of going back to sleep, I came up with how I could have protected my sleep by having some sort of potential butt dial or protection. Now, I wanted this invention to protect me, the recipient of the phone call, and alert me that the caller was potentially butt dialing me. Um, so my invention incorporates a couple of ideas because you, your phone always has the ability to have a GPS locator on it, and it probably has some sort of gyroscope connected into it. And so I could probably have it established that the caller, whenever they're about to make a phone call, it will determine if they're standing or sitting. It can determine if the orientation of the phone is facing downward, maybe in a pocket. And it can determine if it's connected to Bluetooth, maybe they're on the call uh, are in the car or they have a pair of headphones connected. So I wanted to, to determine all these things from the caller and then give me an alert on my phone, determine that within the split second they make the call and silence my phone. So I don't get the vibration or any uh, alarms or noises that the call is coming through. So I'm gonna come to you and ask if my patent, if, if this invention is gonna be patentable. <laughs> And I'm probably going to wish I had this on my phone and I could treat this call where you bring this invention to me as a butt dial and ignore it. But for the purpose of the discussion, let's talk through, okay, you have this idea. You, you have thought it through a little bit. It's more than just, I wish I had some technology to tell me if there had been a butt dial. You've actually thought through, well, how would we technically implement that? We need to get some information from the dialer's phone and there are sensors on the phone. So you've, you've given some thought to it. So there is some sort of conception there and it hasn't been reduced to practice, but it is, it is at least more than just an idea. You know, the, the classic example being, I invented, you know, a rocket ship to Mars. Okay, well, well how do you implement it? Oh, well, I don't know, that's for somebody else to come up with. I invented the idea of it and that's not how it works. So you're thinking about the sensors and using the information from them all of those things, all of those being good questions. So what are some things we can consider now that you've brought this idea to me? And one of them that you have up there is, well, should we do a patentability assessment? And going back to the idea from last year of the pet displaying carrier, that's sort of where we realized, and eh, maybe this isn't worth pursuing because there are other things already out there that are similar to what you have ostensibly invented. So a patentability assessment would be taking a look at what we call prior art. So in this context, it's really anything out there that's publicly available. It's not just patents or patent applications. It can be magazines, it can be journal articles, it can be catalogs. It's, it is truly anything that is publicly available. And we're looking to see if anyone has invented this same thing, have they, have they disclosed this idea? Because when you file a patent application, the patent examiner is going to do that same thing. They're going to look in the prior art, anything that's publicly available, and make a determination of whether or not this thing has been invented. Mm -hmm. So there are some challenges there because one, the ocean of prior art is so vast that there's no way you can really find everything. And of course, time is money. So it's going to take us time to, to do the research, to look and see if this stuff is out there. I can do it. I can, I can search around and poke around. We can hire a professional searcher to do the same thing. But either way you cut it, we're going to start spending money before you've even gotten this thing off the ground. The other concern is when that patent examiner starts looking for your idea, he or she doesn't have to find your exact idea. They can find something that is close to your idea and something else that is close to your idea, and they can piece those things together. And so they can combine prior art references to arrive at your same invention and say that one of skill in the art who found this, it would have been obvious to them to also find this and combine the ideas. And so the challenge with a patentability assessment is you can't ever anticipate what an examiner might start combining. And so a lot of times what I end up advising people of is, sure, let's poke around quickly. 
And if we don't find your exact idea within about an hour, let's just move forward with it. If you think, you know, that there's at least interest in pursuing a patent application in part, because you're going to pay the patent office to do their own patentability assessment. And I cannot tell you how many times people have said, no, no, we really want to do a search. We're really interested in seeing what else is out there. We bring back things that are pretty spot on and pretty close. And the, the client, the inventor goes, no, no, ours is different. Let's move forward. And we could have just saved them the four or $5,000 that they spent on this patentability assessment and use that money elsewhere. So it is an option. It is something you yourself should do. And I think we'll give you some resources on how you can do your own patentability assessment. I may have done that in here. Yeah. yeah. I did my own patentability assessment for this. And then at least you know what's out there and you've got a sense of whether or not this is worth pursuing. But it's not always the thing that I would recommend only because you're going to pay the patent office to do the same thing. That's right. But we need to dig into the requirements for this invention or okay. any invention sure. for patentability. So you kind of already hit on all of these. Some of them, <laughs> yeah. So there's there's different categories that we have to uh, to meet when we present something to the patent office. One is our idea, actual patentable subject matter, and this is what we call you know this is section one hundred and one. And so there are things. You know, for years and years and years, this wasn't a big deal. And then they started trying to figure out how to deal with software. And then Section 101 became a big, you know, a big problem for us. And the general idea is, you know, if it's an abstract idea and Sarah's may fall into that, it may not be patentable subject matter. And so, you know, if it's I, something that I would just classify broadly as data in, data out, right? So there's information from sensors, that information is being analyzed and an alert is given, data in, data out, it may not rise, you know, to the level of being patentable subject matter. But then in the life sciences space, yeah. there's also patentable subject matter concerns. That's right. Uh, natural phenomena are issues uh, that are not going to be patentable, like isolated DNA or even Dolly, the phone sheet. Um, but if you're able to go after different areas of life sciences as in something you've manipulated or um, different ways of, of treating those types of uh, nat or natural phenomena that aren't, aren't patentable, but can manipulate it in a different way to, that transforms it. It might be something that could be. I would say high level takeaway. If, if your invention is software enabled, talk to your patent attorney about, hey, is this even patentable subject matter? If it's on the life sciences side, you're going to have some questions about that as well. If it's a traditional widget, if it's a thing, if it's my ingenious ballpoint pen, this is not going to be a concern for you. What if it's not useful? Well, <laughs> that's a good question. I would have a hard time coming up with anything that is not useful. So there is a requirement that your invention be useful, but I don't think that's a big one. You know, examiners aren't coming back and saying, hey, sorry, guys, this isn't useful, so we're not going to let you pursue it. We've got some examples here of, a, you know, a watch for a dog or a keg that you wear on your head. Um, really and truly, anything that you're willing to pursue will be viewed as useful. Even my, my booty call. Even, even that silly idea, yes. <laughs> Novelty. So we touched on novelty, right? And so one of this, this is what we say falls under 102. And the idea here is, you know, it's, it's an X to X comparison. Your invention is X and we can go out into the prior art and find X, right? All of the elements of your invention are disclosed in a single reference. And so, I mean, let's be honest, the reality is most 102 objections are pretty easy to overcome because it's pretty easy to point to one small, you know, bit of minutia and say, oh, well, it's different from what you found in this way. But the idea is your invention has to be new. It has to have novelty. In the last little bit. Non-obviousness is the tougher one, right? Because, okay, fine. You know, you, you have showed me that your invention is different than the prior art that I found in this minute way. Let me go find a secondary reference and I'll combine the two. And now with X and Y, I've arrived at, you know, at your invention. That's right. 
So now that we've considered all these elements of what it takes to be patentable, um, this is what we've talked about earlier, maybe doing a search on your own. Again, there's no legal requirement to do so. It could save time and money, or it could also cost a lot of time and money, depending on the situation that you're in. And it could find some uh, prior art that is relevant that could help you if you're in the research space still and designing, you could maybe work around what you found in the prior art. That's right. If you're, if you're really keen on getting a patent and you identify some prior art in, in this stage, you know, okay, well, I know that this is something that the examiner is going to consider. I need to distinguish myself from it in some way. And so I can think about that as part of the design process. You know, another thing to consider is, you know, if you're a researcher and you've published a paper and now we're three years down the road and you've improved on the technology that's in the paper, you also have to understand that your paper is prior art against you. And so thinking about how do you distinguish over what you did three years ago? How do you make the case to the patent office to say, no, 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 that's what I did three years ago. Let me tell you how what we're doing now is different and why it's not obvious to make the advancements that we've made in these intervening three years. The other thing to think about if you do a patentability search is everything that you find that is what we call material prior art, material to patentability, you have an obligation to submit that to the patent office. So you don't have any obligation to do prior art searching, but if you find things that are relevant, you do have an obligation to submit those things. So, you know, you may be setting yourself up to have a lot of stuff that you got to go ahead and turn over to the patent office. The other thing I find is people get a little bit, especially if they're, you know, this is their first time through the process, they can get a little bit paralyzed in this process of just trying to find everything that's out there. I would say focus on your invention. Don't focus on what came before and just worry about your thing. And let's let's move forward with that. Well, let's move forward with it. Let's just do a quick patentability search. And you, it doesn't have to be anything that's um, expensive. You could do it just from a basic Google search. There are plenty of databases if you want to dig into specific patents that might be related rather than just uh, things that are currently on the market. Um, so Google patents, there's a lot of other free databases, patent scope. You can also search the patent office's website, um, which is sometimes not the most user-friendly. Um, SciFinder, if you're in the university space, Georgia Tech, Emory especially, you can use that if you're going to be doing small molecule searches. Uh, it's really great. You need a license for it, but I'm pretty sure with the university, uh, you get some access to that. Um, you can also hire search companies or patent professionals. Um, but again, doing your own search, it can be great. Uh, kicking it up a notch, you can include any of these types of uh, different searching uh, factors to help improve your searching. So I did this, did my own patentability assessment of my uh, app. And so I tried uh, just a quick Google search and uh, actually found a few apps that are out there. But on my own search, this ABC anti-butt call, which is a really great acronym. I wish yeah. I would have thought of that. They um, are used for the person that's, that's uh, I guess, a repeat uh, butt caller, and they get to download the app. And they, the, there's uh, some features that sound similar to mine. They can look at the orientation of it, and they can also determine if it may be in a, in a purse or a pocket. Um, but again, the person has to download it. The other one with this other oh, over to the right of the screen, that one has an extra step where you have to slide in order to finish making your call. But again, if you have people like me where my mother-in-law is not going to download this app unless I download it for her, it's, it's not going to protect me, the recipient. So I think it's different. I think we can get around this. <laughs> as most inventors do. And what I would say as, as the skeptical patent attorney or the trying to play the role of the skeptical patent examiner is well, in the ABC, it's using the same information that you said you wanted to use, right? Mm -hmm. The orientation of the phone, is it, in the, is it in the light or the dark, all of those things. The only difference being the alert is coming to you as the person who's being called. As a, but conceptually speaking, so it's a classic of, okay, well, it's not novelty, but it's maybe an obviousness question, right? So it's, it's doing the first part. It's detecting the butt call. Is it obvious to 
send a message to the recipient of the call as opposed to the person making the call. And like most inventors, you would say, no, 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 totally different. Totally different. Let's, let's move forward. <laughs> I also try to do some sort of Google patent search for this. Same search query, uh, 20,000 results. So that's not going to cut it. So I uh, focused it down a little bit um, and focused a little bit more on GPS, maybe orientation. And I got 19 results. And maybe not surprising, all of these patents that showed up are uh, filed in China. Uh, couldn't find any U.S. ones, but that's okay. Maybe I'll just do my invention in the U.S. Um, some of these, oh, this is one of the claims. It's a very long claim. So I kind of pulled out what I think might be relevant. And it still kind of seems like it's gibberish. Uh, means of defense of touch screen and behavior perception, including motion and housing grip detecting sensor, which I think I should include that in my note too. <laughs> but I think what you're seeing here is, you know, there is a lot of prior art out there on this idea. And if we were to pursue yours, you know, it's probably a little bit of a threading the needle that we would have to do to get you a patent that covers your idea, which can lead us to another discussion. Is it even worth you having that patent at the end of the day? If the coverage is going to be extraordinarily narrow and cover a very specific embodiment of what it is you've done, sure, it protects that thing. But it's not really going to protect anyone else. It's going to allow people to design around it pretty easily. So this all leads to good discussions. Well, another thing to consider is I think we've cleared the patentability search. I think my invention is going to be great. Um, one thing to consider, especially in a university setting, is have you told anyone else about your invention? Um, I told you about my invention a couple of weeks ago when I first came up with it. And um, I did not have you sign any type of agreement that said that you can't share that any further. And why this is important is that in the US, there is a one year grace period for specifically the US that if you disclose your invention publicly, you uh, only have one year to get it on file within the US. Most foreign countries uh, do not allow any type of filing after a public disclosure. So it is pretty important, especially if you're in the university going to give a presentation or your graduate student's going to give a poster or even the thesis defense. Um, it is pretty important to consider if you need to get something on file first, uh, especially with your touch, touch base with your tech transfer office, and they can help you determine if that's important to do. And the key there is that it needs to be an enabling public disclosure, right? So if you came to me and we're sitting at lunch and you go, you know, I had this idea. I'm thinking about trying to like come up with this app that'll detect if the person calling you is accidentally calling you. Okay, well, that's not a public enabling disclosure. And, you know, the other thing to think of is practically speaking, how in the world would anyone know that we had that conversation, right? Because we're talking about a patent examiner he can't come and find that that discussion happened. Let's say that you, in this strange universe, you did patent this invention, you built a business around it, and it became just gangbusters valuable. That's right. And then I say, wait a minute, I remember we talked about that. You shouldn't have gotten that patent. You know, you publicly disclosed that to me. You know, we're kind of playing out some strange thread there as well. <laughs> so, you know, think practically. Practically, don't, don't feel like, oh my God, I can't ever talk about my idea because of this thing that Rusty and Sarah said. But if you're doing a poster, you know, that it's something for a presentation, a paper for a conference, those would be enabling to those of skill in the art. General discussions in office hours with a patent attorney, you know, there, there's a sliding scale there. So just don't, don't feel like your lips have to be sealed at all times. Good point. Okay, I'll tell everyone about it. Yeah. So I guess the last point, I moved forward, I filed a patent on it, I want to get my product onto the market. Let's just touch base on freedom to operate. Do I have the ability to start using it without anyone suing me? Yeah, so I mean, big, big difference between patentability and freedom to operate. Let's just say you want to build a business around your idea, sort of irrespective of whether or not you want to file a patent on it. Then we would do a freedom to operate. So before we talked about this sort of ocean of all prior art. But if we're doing freedom to operate, and let's say you just want to build your business in the US, now I only have to look at valid US patents to determine if you're going to infringe any of them. That is a much simpler exercise because we know 
what the pool of things is that we're looking at. And we can sort of sort through it pretty quickly. So if you've got a business, you're going to move forward with a product. I don't typically call it a freedom to operate because to, to truly get to 100% certainty is nearly impossible. What I call it is a risk assessment. So let's look at the field. Let's think about who your competitors are. And let's see if there are any patents that are spot on or pretty close. And we can do a risk assessment. How risky is it if you decide to move forward this product? Well, I'm moving forward a bit. So yeah. hopefully you clear my freedom to operate. But as Rusty said... I wouldn't clear your freedom to operate. I would <laughs> give you a risk assessment that you could then decide if you want to move forward. What we would focus on within those U.S. patents, assuming I'm going to put my product into the U.S. market, we would look just at the claims. That's right. And we um, would maybe even, this could be a point to discuss, well, this patent may have a higher risk. So you could design your app around it to hopefully get around what is in those claims. If you found, yeah, if we found something that was spot on that we thought, hey, this this puts the red alert up a little bit. And if you still want to move forward and you're still in the sort of design phase, this is a good example of, okay, we'll just do this instead of this. You'll get the same practical effect, but you won't infringe this patent that we found. But even in the worst case scenario, I cannot change the design of my app. Is there any way that I could potentially still? We found a patent that's spot on your app is going to infringe it. It cannot be designed around. Then what we start looking at is, should this patent have ever been granted in the first place? And so we start looking at sort of invalidity options. Yes, the examiner granted it. The examiner shouldn't have granted it either because he or she missed a lot of prior art that was out there. The claims are sort of unintelligible. There's, there's you know, sort of grammatical errors or terms that don't match up in the claims. There are plenty of reasons to not shut down your business just because we found a patent that's sort of spot on. I think that I think talking to an attorney is the way to, to go on that route. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's, that brings us to the conclusion of, of my invention and my patentability. Um, so I know this is a very um, strange, I did want to say, I did come up with a name for my, my Great, app. Good, we can trademark that. Thank you. I, I really think that that's the way to go then. Good, good. Should we stop? Yes, I think we can stop. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sarah and Rusty. That was a really interesting exploration of a vital product in the mobile app development <laughs> space. Um, I agree. Uh, so we do have a couple questions, um, but I, I think I wanted to kick off one just sort of following up on the heels of this freedom to operate conversation. So say we had an inventor, or maybe maybe Sarah wasn't as gung ho about the patent uh, outlook for this, but she still really wanted to move forward with this business. What are some ways that she could protect her idea without a patent? Say we thought it was going to be really challenging. What, what would you kind of advise Sarah to do in that situation? I mean, it's a great question and one that I deal with all the time. I mean, I, I feel like I'm usually talking people out of patents and you might've gotten that sense from the talk. If you go back to one of the earlier slides, it kind of showed the overlap of copyrights, trademark, trademarks, trade secrets, and patents. And I usually look at it from the standpoint of, okay, this is an app. So there's going to be user terms and conditions, right? That kind of govern the behavior of the people who have access to it and have the ability to use it. Certainly NDAs, when you're talking to developers and when you're going to get this thing made, you want to make sure that the right agreements are in place, that they're assigning the rights in it to you, and that they're not going to take the idea and do something else with it. Um, you know, those are the things that I would be thinking about, especially in the app base, is the contractual agreements that are going to help you. Could you file, you know, a copyright on the code for the app? Of course you can. It's not going to give you a lot of protection. It's also not going to cost you very much. So it doesn't necessarily hurt to do that. And then, you know, filing for a trademark that protects your brand. And that way, if you start building up some equity in the name of your business and you're early in the field and people just start to know who you are, that's another way to protect yourself. So there's kind of some easy low hanging fruit that you can do between, you know, copyright application, trademarks. And then the contractual things that you can do to really make sure 
you know, and when you've got a contract and things go sideways, now you're dealing with a breach of contract claim, which is a heck of a lot easier, in my opinion, to deal with than a patent infringement situation, which is extraordinarily complicated and expensive. Got it. Yeah, thanks for that perspective. Um, so also to our audience, again, please feel free to submit questions in the Q&A. Um, we did have one come in that I think is um, relevant to this discussion, actually. So this um, person says, we have a machine learning model used in our startup, which is core to our differential offering. Do we need to patent it? And if so, how? Um, so I'd love to turn to some of our, the representatives from our tech transfer offices, because I feel like we're seeing more and more machine learning, artificial intelligence technologies. Um, what is your perspective on, on this question? Hi, everybody. Uh, I'll, I'll take this one, uh, or at least take a stab at it first. So we're seeing, we at Emory are seeing a lot more AI technologies come through our office. It's not only has it been an emphasis for the university to go out and hire some preeminent AI faculty and researchers to come into the university, but also just it's, it's, uh, it's become a very active area of research for the existing faculty on our campus, even in some surprising spaces. Uh, we have tried very hard to identify where we can uh, file patent applications on our AI technologies. Uh, I, you know, it's, it's not, you can't always protect it, but where we can, we have tried hard to move forward with the patent applications. Um, it, it puts the, it, it definitely puts the university in a stronger space, at least in our view. Um, so instead of just relying on the copyright, we're also trying to move forward with the patent applications. And I, I would totally second that. It's a little bit frustrating because it is such a hot area and there are a lot of potential licensees out there. And if it doesn't look good for filing a patent, it's less attractive to license. But I would say um, when I was at Stanford, we made a fair amount of money, a lot of licenses off of software, just copyright. So it's possible, it depends on the invention, but definitely um, patents aren't always the way you can go. That makes sense. We've been yeah, getting- it, totally... Oh, I'm oh. so sorry. No, so Mary, I was just gonna say, it's, a, it's an interesting push from our faculty members. We're getting them, Earlier, they hadn't been pushing so hard to get the patent applications filed on their software, but now we're seeing them push pretty hard for it as well. Um, and it's been an interesting transition, an interesting change of perspective from our faculty members. It it is interesting, and with I'm not I'm not a patent agent or a patent attorney. I've been doing this for 28 years, but I don't know all the ins and outs of trying to patent some kind of AI. So I look for advice. We have a patent agent in-house who knows a lot about software and I talk to him about it, um, but our inventors are pushing it to getting software patented. And what I was gonna say is, you know, there's, there's sort of two different ideas there. I think the original question said that we're using AI as part of our model. That, from my perspective and, you know, from what I've seen, is more difficult to protect, right? That is truly, it is, in, it is terribly complex and truly innovative, but from the patent office's perspective, again, it's data in, data out. And so when we talk about that 101 question, eligible subject matter, we have an uphill battle there. If, on the other hand, you're truly improving the way that AI functions, Right, you're not using AI for your application. Your invention is new types of AI, new types of you know deep learning models, that type of thing. You have a you're improving existing technology, so you have a little bit easier case. In that first one, though, what I always caution is, let's say that you can get a patent. Uh, it's it's you get over that abstract idea question. What you're often going to have to do is put so much detail into the application about your algorithm. I always give the example of you're giving someone the entire recipe and ingredients to your cake. And at the end of the day, you have a patent that covers the method to bake that exact cake. 
But if now that I've got your recipe and the ingredients, I can make a couple of tweaks, right? I can change out sugar. I can put in honey, whatever it might be. And now I don't infringe your patent that you spent all this time and money to get. And I know exactly how to do all of this thing that you spent all this time, money and research coming up with. So I think that's the risk that you have to weigh. Is this worth pursuing in patent or should we just cover this as trade secrets? We'll use terms and conditions, user, user license agreements and protect it that way. So that's, you know, that's usually how the discussion goes. Thanks, Rusty. I think that's really good perspective. Sorry, uh, Laura, were you going to say something? Yeah. Well, I was going to say something briefly. Uh, I can't help myself. Uh, so Rusty, it is one one difference between working for a corporation who is developing the AI and training it in-house as opposed to working at a university where you're going to be receiving those federal funds. The ability for us to keep something as trade secret is just so difficult. Sure, um, absolutely. So there are, you know, it, I, I, your point is absolutely spot on. Uh, but it, that, that I think, trade secret issue. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it really is. It's 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 first of all okay. Well, what's the goal? What would the goal be in having the patent? So yeah, we're thinking about it the exact same way. Yeah, I like your distinction of like, is your innovation in the machine learning itself? Are you changing the way that that software is running? Is it a new way of you know machine learning, or are you is your innovation based on using existing AI frameworks, existing machine learning in, in a unique way. Um, and maybe thinking about it from that lens helps figure out like, what, what do we want to put the resources into protecting? Um, so I think that dovetails really well, because I know that beyond just AI and machine learning, there are a lot of technologies coming out of the university that involved a software component, maybe with other things. Um, and I remember in my tech transfer days, we would see something that was maybe a, a clinical decision support tool leading to some kind of specific treatment regimen, or maybe a device and software combo where there's some hardware associated with it. And then you've also got uh, software to control that and you know make certain decisions. So for these kind of like multi-component technologies, um, what are some advice for entrepreneurs in that space? Should they should they try to kind of slice this up into different inventions, different patent filings? Should you take a more holistic view of this? Um, how do you, yeah, how, how would you kind of take apart a, a more complex innovation like that and, and figure out what the what the protectable parts are? Well, again, I'd be curious to hear what Rusty and Sarah have to say from a patent professional's experience but whenever we had something complex you know there would be certain things that weren't worth going after but you can either try and write the application very well and split it up if that's logical from a patentability standpoint and um, an enforcement standpoint but if we didn't know and threw everything into one application you have the opportunity later when they say, you know, when they call it divisional, then you can split out whatever you found is mo most valuable by then. Yeah, and one Mary, thing that's... I would add on to Mary, sorry, Rusty, uh, no, is just the, the value of spending that time with your tech transfer office and your licensing associate or mm -hmm. the, the patent attorney that you're working with as you're working through the, the disclosure of your invention. Uh, I know oftentimes it seems like there's a lot of wasted time working with your licensing associate or perceived wasted time working with a licensing associate to walk through all of the different details associated with your invention. But the more that we know about it, and the more that we can include and evaluate as part of our upfront work, the better that we can work with our patent attorneys to um, better disclose and then potentially go after all each of those different types of inventions through the divisional, through the con that gets filed later. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Rusty. Oh, no, you're both you're both spot on. I mean, you know, there's there's so many times that the inventors are thinking of, you know, I always give the example of like Salesforce or Amazon or something like that, where it's just this grand ecosystem of things that can be done. And let's start breaking that down and, and let's start making a list of sort of the inventive concepts. And let's start with the top two or three or four things that if you found out someone was doing this specific thing that's part of this overall ecosystem that you've come up with, what would you be really upset about? And let's kind of start there and start breaking those things apart. Like Mary said, they can all go into one application. 
several different inventive concepts that you pursue in their own claim sets and continuations and divisionals and all of that. Or you can break them up into individual applications. It, it really, there's no right or wrong answer there. It's really about what your strategy is. How do you want to, you know, sort of spend your money? How do you want your portfolio to look? All of those things. But I think for exactly like Laura said, start breaking it down. Tell us as much as you can about the individual pieces. And I think a lot of times that's helpful for the inventors because they kind of have their head in the whole thing and, and sort of forcing them to talk about pieces individually. How do those pieces interact? You know, it, it really helps them crystallize their thoughts in terms of what their invention actually is. And we've just recently gone through an exercise with a, with a technology or actually a couple of technologies where they were originally disclosed as, as more broad. And then we decided to break them down into individual filings and separate patent applications in part because we anticipate that we're going to have lic different licensees for the different technologies. So it's easier for us as an office if we have separate patent filings on those individual inventions so that we can separately license and separately track the development of those technologies. And it was, um, you know, it was through taking the time with our office and working through the details of what the invention was that we came up with that strategy, which I, I really think is going to be a good one for both the inventor uh, and, and the ultimate licensees. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, and thanks for Rusty and Mary for your, your thoughts on that as well. Um, so uh, I think a, a common theme in this is going to be disclosed to your tech transfer office early, stay in close communication, because um, the sooner that they know about what you're working on, the sooner they can they can come up with some of these more creative solutions to help you. Um, so I don't see any open questions now, but I, I do have a couple of questions of my own. Again, please feel free to submit questions. We've still got another um, five or 10 minutes here. So one situation that I remember coming up, and, and this might be a tricky one, is say I'm a, um, a biochemist or a cell biologist, and I do a lot of foundational kind of basic research into different pathways, signaling pathways, and I found that by down-regulating one of them, I might have some therapeutic effect. But I don't have a brand new compound to do this. Maybe I was using a genetic knockout or an existing compound. And I'm thinking about translating this technology, but now I'm remembering what Sarah said. And I said, okay, well, I don't know if a, a law of nature is a patentable subject matter here. Um, what do you advise that I do? I think that I've got something new. No one's shown this mechanism before, but I don't have a brand new antibody or small molecule to, to go after this. What, what's some advice for an entrepreneur in that situation? <laughs> I think it'll, it'll depend, honestly. Um, in the university setting, I think Laura and Mary would agree that you can't really hold on to that as a trade secret and keep working to develop some sort of antibody or um, way to target, actually target that, that spot. But um, if you're not in the university and you do have the capabilities, that's, that's a whole different discussion then on working towards maybe doing some drug screening, figuring out a small molecule or some way to actually make that work. But um, in the university setting, let's go back to that. Um, and you're right, like if it's merely just a, a natural phenomenon that you've discovered a, a, a gene that could be targeted to turn off something, you, you might need a little bit more. Like Rusty said, the data in, data out, you need to start transforming it. You need to have some sort of way to manipulate that and transform it. But it's going to be fact, fact specific on what your invention really is. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, one other thing that you can do in a university setting is you could look for a potential collaborator. Uh, we at Emory are very fortunate that we have a lot of really great uh, drug developers. We have a lot of really great chemists. So maybe there's somebody within the university that you could collaborate with and take them your idea and see if you can't find that next uh, blockbuster drug to treat whichever, you know, to, to create the next big treatment. Thanks. Yeah. And I'll put in a shameless plug for Biolocity here as well. This is a, a situation that that we work with a lot. So if you've got some kind of basic research and you're looking for what that next step is or hoping to be introduced to collaborators who could help do some medicinal chemistry or whatever, um, please reach out to us because we'd be happy to brainstorm with you as well. Well done. Well done, John. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so I think maybe following up on that, another sort of general question that, that might be relevant for our academic audience 
you know, as academics, as researchers, they've got a uh, prerogative to publish and to share their results with the world. And we just heard in this presentation, there's some liabilities there on the IP side of things, because you don't want to sort of become your own prior art or publish before you, you file a patent application. So I think it's a common tension if you're working as, a, as an academic, academic who's hoping to, to, you know, commercialize your technology. Um, this might be a little open-ended, but what are some ways, um, and I, I guess I'm, I'm looking at the, the tech transfer folks here, how do you propose that they maybe resolve this tension or, or, or yeah, move forward with this? Um, for, for us right now, especially, a lot of it has to be education um, and then hopefully word of mouth from them and they learn the hard way. But I have to tell you, even with education, I'm going out and doing, you know, brown bag lunches so people can know who we are, what we do, what is IP and, you know, what is patenting and all those things. I have a slide that says, you know, when do you come to us? And in big letters, it says before you publish. <laughs> and then I have a slide, you know, that says enabling disclosure. And what does that mean? And what are all the ways you do that? And then somebody came up to me afterwards and said, so after I publish, I come to you and make a disclosure. And I was like, <laughs> oh, my goodness, you know, and I don't have that many slides and they're not text dense. And I talk most of the time. So yes, education for us is a big deal and learning the hard way. Um, and then there's word of mouth. I, th if there's a better way, I'm dying to hear what it is. We're always trying to work with our faculty members as best as we can to get those invention disclosures early and to get them with the, uh, the expected publication date. Uh, we file a good number of cover sheet provisionals in our office. We file a lot more than I would like. Um, they're dangerous filings and just that people think that they have a patent application that is going to protect them and is going to give them full protection for whatever it is that they disclose. Uh, so if you say that you, you send in or you use as your invention disclosure a, a poster and it has some information, but then you give a presentation associated with your poster and you go significantly beyond just what's in that poster, that can create some real problems for our office and for us to be able to protect what your core invention is if you disclose it through that publication, but it's not actually in that poster. Um, so I think that the cover sheet provisional can be such a dangerous uh, can be such a dangerous thing because the faculty members do believe that they have the protections that they need. Um, but if if you had possibly disclosed it to the office a, a bit earlier, and maybe we could have gotten maybe not a full provisional prepared, but maybe a uh, a bit of a hybrid so that we could better protect what the core invention is before um, that public presentation had been made. And that's a really good point. I don't like cover sheets at all. We file them when somebody's desperate and they really are pushing, but that was part of my education. It wasn't just come to us, you know, before you publish, it was come to us two months before you publish. So we have time to do what we need to do and then investigate and then have the patent attorney actually have time to write an application. But if they don't even remember that they're supposed to come up, come to us before publication, they're not gonna <laughs> pay attention to come to us two months before. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and once again, common theme, talk to your tech transfer office early. <laughs> Um, because a cover sheet provisional is not the same thing as a fully drafted provisional application. That's not the same thing as a non-provisional application. And that's not the same thing as an issued patent. So each of those kind of has its own steps and your tech transfer office can, can definitely walk you through those. So we've got just a, a couple of minutes left. We did get one more question in. Um, so this is a question specific to a, a particular piece of technology. This person asks, um, how do you handle a new, simple interview-based measure that you may use to assess whether a medication is working? So it sounds like maybe some kind of a survey or interview tool um, for medication efficacy. Um, and then they say, what if, what if you develop an app based on this for clinicians or pharma companies? What would be some ways that, um, that this person could maybe think about protecting that technology? It, yeah, oh, go ahead. I mean, I'd, be, I'd be glad to at least give my thoughts on it. It's it's tricky for sure. Um, you know, we have a lot of time, a lot of situations where, you know, hospitals will invest large amounts of dollars and times into, you know, protocols is kind of what I would think of them as. So, you know, what should a, what should a nurse do when they enter a patient's room? Like what's the proper steps to go through and really coming up with, 
you know, verified results. This is the best way to do it. All of these things. At the end of the day, you've kind of got a list of steps for people to follow. And in that, in the patent world, in that abstract idea, it falls under this category of methods of organizing human behavior, right? And so that's not patentable subject matter. And then, okay, well, what if we put it into an app? Well, we're still in that sort of same realm of data in, data out, right? It's just a list. It's that same list of steps. And now they're just clicking on the app to confirm that they've done them. So it is challenging. And, you know, this is where we go back to, is copyright the right way to do it? Obviously, it's not a trade secret. You're making it available. There are ways that you can sort of brand these things and sort of sell licenses to it. If you build up enough equity in your name and in this program, and then others can say that they're compliant with the thing that you've developed. None of those are easy though. And they all kind of take time. And Mary, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, I was going to say, again, this was at Stanford, but we had things that were just basically triage, you know, a list of questions and a little tree. And Mm -hmm. one of them, we licensed like crazy because even though they couldn't use our name in publicity, they could make a statement of fact and they would say, you know, we got this from Stanford and verbally they could say whatever they want. We'll never know. So that had a cache that um, they thought it was valuable, but you're right. It has to be kind of branding. That's right. Yeah. Stanford's name carries a lot more weight than Sarah and I came up with a protocol and, and we'd like to license that out. But I, but it's the exact same concept. You kind of have to have the equity in your name. We oh, have a, uh, sorry, I just briefly, yeah, we, I, we at Emory have a questionnaire that has become the gold standard for quantifying what is typically a qualitative issue. So it's around dermatological uh, issues. So does something make you itch? And then a quantitative evaluation of where you are on that spectrum. And it's been clinically validated and has become the gold standard. And it's it's really, um, it is something that we have licensed out significantly and has been, um, has just been a, a really great product for various pharma companies and then for universities who are doing research as well. So, but that's, we we, we protect it purely by copyright. Right. Yep. And, and we Laura, tell some remember, people, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I remember my time there at Emory managing those types of copyrighted, clinically validated types of questionnaires. And if those types of questionnaires, information sheets that you are providing are being used in like clinical trials, they are extremely valuable. And putting it into an app would be a derivative of the original copyright. So that's just another point. Yeah, I think we're out of time. I don't need to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks so much. I think that was a really valuable perspective. And another, I think, key take home from this conversation is you don't always need a patent. There's still ways to protect your technology <laughs> and, and commercialize without it. So we are a few minutes over. Um, I want to again thank our panelists so much and our speakers for this um, discussion. I think it was really helpful. Um, please feel free, in the, those of you in the audience, to reach out if you've got further questions. Um, and otherwise, we hope to see you at our January Bench to Market talk.